<laughs> Pappy Nubs. He sure loved his marking gauges. We used to call him Pappy Marking Gauge Nubs. It's said that during the Great Depression, he supported the whole family with his marking gauge. He'd just go from town to town finding people that needed their boards marked and penny a scratch. You remember when I said you needed at least three gauges? Well, here's what I meant. This first one is simple. It's a single pin gauge, the most basic of the set. It's used for marking lines perpendicular to the edge or the face of a workpiece, making dovetails, raised panels, ripping and thicknessing boards. An old-timey woodworker used this gauge constantly. The second is a double pin mortising gauge. One pin is fixed in the end and the other is adjustable. You set the pins to the width of your mortise chisel and then you use it to lay out both the mortise and the tenon. Since mortise and tenon joinery is used in all sorts of woodworking projects, this is another essential tool. And the third is the cutting gauge. This is similar to the standard marking gauge except instead of a pin, it has a stiff blade for slicing wood fibers. These are used in all sorts of things, from cutting veneers to severing the fibers across the grain of a workpiece before you use a plane to cut a rabbit. This one in particular is a double pole cutting gauge that's actually a little bit unique. Those are the three most important gauges, but Pappy had a few other ones too that are worth mentioning. This is a panel gauge, which is just a larger version of the regular single pin marking gauge. You don't see these a lot in modern workshops, but old timey woodworkers used them all the time for a layout down the center of a wide board that you want to rip into narrower ones. This one's about 150 years old. These gauges, on the other hand, are more modern. They're standard marking gauges that have a round cutter on the end instead of a pin. Old timey woodworkers would have loved to use these because they work much more smoothly, especially if you're transferring a line around the edge of the board. And the beveled cutter pulls the fence against the edge, reducing the gauge's tendency to wander. Pappy Nub sure loved his marking gauges. And who could blame him? These suckers are among the most versatile tools in any tool chest, not just the old timey woodwork. You might think using a marking gauge is a simple thing. You just set it and scratch it. Us guy woodworkers know how to scratch them, alright? <laughs> a pie. But some people have a hard time getting the hang of it at first, and while those people are fun to make fun of, there are a few tips that will guarantee you're the one that's doing the mocking. The most common problem is when the pin follows the movement of the grain instead of making a crisp straight line where you want it. The way to solve this is simple. First, start with the gauge turned so that the pin is up off the wood. As you start your stroke, you rotate the gauge so that the pin is dragging across the surface, kind of at an angle. Most of the pressure should be on the fence, keeping it tight up against the edge of the workpiece. You're not trying to gouge out a line in one stroke. Take a couple of light passes to make your mark. Another common problem people have is when their gauges go dull. You have to keep them sharp, just like any tool in the workshop. Touch up the pins with a file every now and then, and hone the blade and the cutting gauge just like you would a marking knife. It's also a good idea to have one or two extra marking gauges around. For example, if you're making a dovetailed chest, the thickness of your stock will be the same as the length of your dovetails. That same measurement may also be repeated elsewhere in the project. Or you may have a couple of different sizes of mortises repeated throughout the project. If you have an extra gauge or two that you can set to those dimensions and leave it there, that will save you a lot of time and minimize the mistakes throughout the project.